Devin Pike with the Dallas International Film Festival. And you hear the phrase that the world is interconnected and every single life form impacts the other. And you never get the real sense of that interconnectivity unless you can get someone behind the lens of a camera and show you specifically how this actually works. If anyone is able to do that, it's the person who brought wings of life to the Dallas International Film Festival. It's director Louis Schwartzman. First, Louis, gorgeous, gorgeous movie. Thank you so much for bringing it to the festival. My pleasure. I mean, what a joy to come back to Dallas. Got a lot of friends in Dallas, so it's great to share it with this, uh, you know, great, great community. You're a groundbreaking cinematographer. Uh, your work on Kuyana Scotsi influenced a generation of not only nature photographers, but just cinematographers in general. When you were looking at putting together Wings of Life and being able to tell the story of how birds, bees, and bats influence our daily life, even in our ultra-urban areas and the fragile cycle that we're looking to destroy. Talk a little bit about when you were looking to put the film together and how long you've been working on it. Well, for a long time I wanted to tell the story about flowers. Um, one of the things that happened when I graduated from UCLA is I wanted to shoot 35 millimeter film, but it's expensive. So I found this old 35 millimeter Mitchell and I started to shoot time lapse for two reasons. One, I enjoyed the beauty of watching the flowers come to life move to the light, but also because I was only shooting one frame every 20 minutes, which meant I was shooting two seconds every day, and I could afford to do that. Um, so it's been like a 35-year journey for me. I've been shooting time-lapse almost nonstop, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when I heard that the bees were disappearing, that, you know, which is critical to our survival, one-third of the food we eat comes from a bee-pollinated uh, plant, um, I figured you can't tell the story about the bees without telling the story about flowers, how they co-evolved over 150 million years, and how it potentially it could unravel. And then when I got deeper into it, I learned, well, besides the bees, you've got other pollinators, hummingbirds, bats, butterflies, that also create ecosystems for many animals to live in. So it's a, it became a giant story. It was almost like an environmental issue for me in the beginning. But it's more of a spiritual journey because, in a way, this is the intersection between the animal world and the plant world, where life regenerates itself billions of times per day, where DNA gets moved forward, where life force as energy moves forward. So, for me, it became an extraordinary adventure to be on that journey. You, you've been working on this film, as you said, for 35 years. At some point, you're looking at it and going, there's not a narrative here that I have, but I know there's a story behind it. I mean, through the early years where you were capturing these, you know, captured, and not only just the, the two frames per day, but also, you know, the incredible stop motion of photography where you're capturing a hummingbird in flight and just the, the, the intricate detail of how the wings are working and you don't really get a sense of that mm. until you see it blown up on a right. large movie screen. But you're, you're, you're looking at it going, I know there's a story here somewhere. Well, I, I, I always knew there was a story in terms of even the flowers. I mean, without flowers, there would be no mammals. You know, back in the days of the dinosaurs, they were just eating green leafy things. And then when flowers evolved, after a big asteroid hit the planet, supposedly, we had energy, little seed po packets called seeds or berries or fruit. That's when mammals evolved. So we wouldn't be here if flowers weren't here. So that in itself, to me, was a big enough story. But when you add the fact that you know, the bees are at risk and these other pollinators are critical to our survival, well, then that story became, I think, more realized. And I talked to scientific advisors, and I would try to analyze what's well, the best example or antidote of, you know, that would be entertaining and relatable. Like in the beginning of the film, like you know, the orchid bee. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's a great story. This orchid bee goes to get perfume from the orchid flower, falls in the bucket, almost drowns, gets pollen glued to it to its back, has only one escape route through the back, and then after it goes through this incredible two-hour you know, torture practically, it goes to another orchid flower and does the same thing over again. And I kind of thought that's like a guy going from bar to bar trying to pick up on a girl and blowing it all the time. So I thought it was a relatable story, as well as the fact it's kind of entertaining and that it's not always a symbiotic situation in nature. You know, a lot of times there's trickery 
and deceit. If you can get what you need for the least amount of energy, if a flower can make you attract a pollinator with a sweet smell but not deliver sugar, it'll do that. It's a short-term relationship because eventually, you know, the pollinators wise up and go, hey, we're not getting any food over here, and I got tricked. But I like the idea that it isn't always a Pollyanna story. Are you surprised that there's so little knowledge in the public on how interconnected the world winds up being? Even after seeing a movie like Wings of Life, mm -hmm. they, 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 they live in a bubble thinking, my actions don't have consequences. I am actually surprised. I mean, I was just at a, five minutes ago, we just left SMU where I did a master class for, with filmmaking students, and I asked the class, how many of them knew that the bees are in trouble and they're you know, disappearing and less than half the people raised their hand. Um, I bet if we ask people how many people know that a tomato comes from a flower, I bet less than a third of the people would know that. But I kind of like the idea that you have these big aha moments, like where does a fruit come from? A flower becomes a fruit. I mean, it's so obvious that 100 years ago when man was more connected to the land, you know, you, yeah, you see flowers on a bush, the bears know it, you'd know that, hey, in a couple of weeks we got blueberries, or we got blackberries happening, right? But we live in a world where you buy those things in a supermarket, and we have no connection between the plants and, and nature. And that's, I think, one of the things I'm trying to hopefully do with the film is create that connection. We are a part of nature, not apart from it. Man is, and it's like, there's us and nature. Oh, we got to take care of it or we're ruining it. We are definitely a part of it. Whatever we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. With the research that you had done in the film, the, the various scientists that you spoke to, is, are, are we getting to a point, or have we already come to the point where we're already past the bit of no return and able to fix the damage that we're doing to the ecosystem? Sadly enough, if you talk to a lot of scientists today, the latest research says we are heading towards a great extinction. And I don't want that to be a bummer, but that's what the experts say. Mm. You well, know? I'm not a nihilist, so of course no, I'm not. And we are losing, <laughs> we're losing more species. We may lose half the species on our planet in less than the next 30 or 40 years. And and what... This isn't we, something that's going to happen <clears throat> that our great-grandchildren will see it. We'll see it. And, and who knows what that effect will be. I mean, life would be radically different, we know, without pollinators. Um, Einstein supposedly said that if the bees go, man would only have five years left to live. On the other hand, I'm not trying to, you know, get people depressed. I think that what we can do is we need a shift in consciousness. You know, we, we know what to do about saving the, the environment. We know that if you don't use pesticides, it's better off for the bees. GMO foods, all these things need to, can be changed. Um, but we need to change our behavior. And, and hopefully films can help educate people and create that shift of consciousness. One of the beautiful things I think about observing nature makes you more mindful, makes you more present, makes you more compassionate. So forgetting the environmental issue for a moment, once you become a more conscious human being, it's hard to step on life. And we need to nurture life, we need to celebrate life. And then what I've kind of learned, I think, from shooting all these years is the fact that in nature, I think, created beauty as a tool for survival because you'll protect what you fall in love with. So in the film, I'm trying to create that emotional connection. You know, I'm not telling you what to do. Recycle. Turn off the electricity. I'm not giving you that kind of a to-do list or to scare you. All I'm saying is this is a beautiful love story that evolved over 150 million years. It feeds us. It sustains life. And let's be careful because this whole thing could unravel. Let's talk a little bit about the future of the film. Uh, it's in the festival area right now. Um, the word has to get out, obviously, so for that love story to be told. So let's talk a little bit about the future of the film and where people can see it outside of the festivals. Well, after the festival, it'll be available on Blu-ray April 16th and VOD, and then on Netflix probably three months later. So I'm really happy that it'll be distributed widely to more people. You know, um, little towns everywhere will be able to get access to it. Um, and actually, all the uh, new digital platforms are vying for it because it's coming out right before Earth Day. So they all want to have this great eye candy. 
to promote their website. And I'm loving the fact that they're all, you know, really inspired by it. They're calling it like inspiring bugs and bees and joy for the eyeballs. And I like those little buzz frames that they're coming up with on their own. Um, so it's great. I mean, it's always been eye candy, but if, if the eye candy can be nutritious, it's way better. And, you know, it's certainly not a GMO by any sort of no. thing. Um, the film is Wings of Life, and again, calling it gorgeous doesn't do it justice. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing piece of work. Thank you so much for bringing it to the festival. I can't not tell you how amazing it was to watch it. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Okay.